So um, I'm Juliet Losk. I'm an artist and I'm doing a PhD in drawing at the Arts University in Bournemouth. Um, I'm in my third year of um, potentially five, but hopefully four. Um, and my PhD is, well, my practice in respect to the PhD is really focusing on installations um, that respond to contemporary sites of ruination. Um, and they're based on model making, um, which I'm going to kind of explain as we go through. Um, so my drawing practice has focused on sites of contemporary ruination for a number of years. Um, through my research, I aim to convey the distinctive material and spatial neglect in such sites. It's through the form of the teleorama that I intend to explore ruins as spaces which incorporate temporal and symbolic associations in which time and space collapse. I adopt the term modern ruins as advanced by the theorist Tim Edenzor, who explores post-industrial sites of ruination as emblems of transitoriness that incorporate spatial and temporal dimensions. Modern ruins are distinguished from any other kind of ruins by their ephemerality. They are situated within a period of varying duration between abandonment and potential future redevelopment. So just to introduce you to the basis of my models, Teleoramas were fragile models made from paper cutouts, which could be housed in a box or concertina form. They had a viewing aperture that varied in size from a peephole, which you can see on the left, to a vista, which you can see on the right. These devices were designed to be held by the viewer who enjoyed a private and individual experience. In some cases, the viewer had to unfold the teleorama or construct it as a kit from a series of flats. In this sense, they can exist in a collapsed state or an unfolded and constructed state and can be considered in terms of their two-dimensional drawn, painted and etched imagery and in terms of their three-dimensional status as objects with an internal volume. I use the teleorama as the basis for building my own paper ruins. Informed by the form of the teleorama, the models enable me to present an imaginative reinterpretation of the original site. These fragile temporary structures evoke the fragility and temporality of the, of the sites that they represent. Their layered structure enables me to represent multiple views of the same site at different stages of the ruination process. Through imagination, I exaggerate the process of collapse and ruination, projecting a potential future onto sites that are in reality at an earlier stage of ruination. Through the process of reconstruction, my research develops an understanding of the teleorama as a partially imagined, partially real space that can transport the viewer conceptually from one place to another. By using the teleorama maquettes to experiment with drawn compositions, I explore the effects of disrupting the affected view based on my research on the historical form. Through scaling up these drawings, I can reinterpret this by designing large scale in installations. This enables me to create teleoramas that are potentially capable of being physically entered and navigated by the viewer. Through examining historical theories and compositional devices to discuss the teleorama, I aim to develop an understanding of this device as both a series of drawings on two dimensional planes and a three dimensional object. So one of the main theorists that I've looked at is Michael Fried, um, who wrote Absorption and Theatricality in 1980. Um, Fried advances absorption and theatricality as concepts for understanding and interpreting paintings, including those of the relevant time period to these devices that I'm looking at, which is the 18th century. Um, Fried theorizes that the beholder of a landscape painting experiences absorption by his presence as a viewer being removed by him being invited out of his role as a beholder and into the painting itself. So he uses um, Joseph Verne as an example of how absorption works. And he talks about the way that Joseph Verne kind of leads um, the viewer to navigate the space of the painting physically by including these different centers of action that draw us in. Um, and also um, by the use of recession um, and other pictorial devices. By exploring whether picturesque paintings are absorptive, absorptive or theatrical in Freed's terms, I explore, I question their ability to be used in theorizing teleorama, a device which appears overtly theatrical in its construction. Hess and Talamad, your theorists, identify the picturesque as a mode of seeing that depended on imposing a perceptual and literal frame around the landscape. 
This is exemplified in James Norrie's picturesque river landscapes with classical buildings and ruins on the left. The experience of entering the landscape is enhanced by distinct layers of recession into depth and shifts of scale. The Telerama is noticeably reminiscent of Norrie's paintings. You could imagine sectioning off each receding plane of Norrie's compositions and turning this into a cutout. The trees and ruins that flank the composition would become flats, diminishing in scale and saturation as their distance from the viewer increases. The creation of a vista using framing devices on all four sides of the Telerama creates a space that is comparable to, but even more enclosed than Norrie's compositions. Each of the two dimensional elements of the Telerama conforms to the compositional structure of a single picturesque painting when combined as a flat plane. When expanded, these planes have more in common visually and spatially with a theatre set, however. Can the Telerama also be described as theatrical in Freed's terms? According to Freed, theatrical artworks resist absorption by setting up a distance between the viewer and the object being viewed, like the distance between actors on the stage and an audience. In accessing the miniature space of the paper peep show or Telerama, the viewer creates his or her, her own performance in a sense, from the action of folding it out to finding the ideal viewpoint from which to access it. In this sense, the exclusion of everything other than the unique experience of viewing eliminates the possibility of theatricality by enhancing the arresting absorptive qualities of what is viewed. But how do we contextualize the Telerama in its expanded three-dimensional form? Comparing and contrasting the Telerama with the three-dimensional picturesque, the picturesque garden, highlights the distinctiveness of the Telerama as a form. There is an equivalence between how the landscape garden and the Telerama construct a vista. Both use trees and shrubs to frame a distant building. Banks of planting create dis distinct layers of trees of different varieties and colors that equate to the separate layers of the Telerama. There are also significant differences between the two in terms of spatiality. Paintings and drawings of picturesque landscapes were absorptive by encouraging the viewer to explore them imaginatively. Gardens were physically immersive, however. The status of the garden as a navigable space affected access to and reading of the viewpoints created by the garden designer. Picturesque garden design breaks with the autonomy of single point perspective by providing serial vision or multiple viewpoints. Space becomes fluid as opposed to paintings where it is fixed. The top participant in the space of the scaled up Telerama and the picturesque garden enjoys a degree of control over these views, being able to change and reorganize them by changing his or her position. The Telerama is situated somewhere between a completely three-dimensional construction of the garden and an exclusively two-dimensional construction, painting, engraving, or watercolor. In contrast to the garden, the historical form of the Telerama dictated that each of its separate layers should operate under the rules of single point perspective from a fixed position outside of a limited, a delimited boundary. In picturesque painting and drawing, the constituent layers of the painting are merged or blended together by the eye of the viewer through the use of painterly compositional devices such as aerial perspective, which you can see on the uh, painting above. We are unable to complete the space between the layers within a Telerama by changing our viewpoint to access, access this as we can through serial vision in the landscape garden. Since even if we could enter the Telerama, the space between the layers in the Telerama is empty. Therefore, even if we could fully access the Telerama as a space, we would always see the landscape as a series of layers. This layered vision, um, dependent on the drawn flats or cutouts that constitute the landscape within a Telerama, is unique to this form. If the form of the Telerama is scaled up to the point at which it can be entered and navigated, the authority of the single viewpoint is disrupted. The viewer can orient themselves to gain a unique viewpoint of each frame of the Telerama, discovering different juxtapositions of imagery and conflicting operations of perspective. A single commanding view can be achieved from a particular location, but as soon as the viewer meanders through the form, he triggers new visual relationships between diverse fragments of imagery. The philosopher Arnold Berlion theorizes immersion as an aesthetics of engagement. In comparison with the viewer of the picturesque landscape painting, who contemplates this form from a, from a privileged point of view, external to the frame, engagement requires the frame or the proscenium arch to be erased. This ensures that we are on the same plane and in the same space as the object that we're contemplating. So in this installation, you can kind of see that you can access all of the frames 
not only from the privileged position of standing in front of it, but as you walk through, you can, you can clearly see that it's still subdivided into these distinct frames. Um, it is, I suggest, not the scaling up that makes the Teleorama immersive. It is the immersive quality of the Teleorama that reveals scaling as a means to install drawings in a new way. A unique viewing experience is brought about using flats to create a distinctive layered space to be experienced by the viewer and by their bringing to it their own imaginative associations and through the relative autonomy they are afforded by navigating around the space and positioning their viewpoint. In this sense, like the viewer of the historical teleorama, they retain this notion of a personal viewing experience and are essential to the activation and completion of the work of art. So in my paper, I compare and contrast uh, these teleorama installations with existing installation practices that have things in common with them, but um, the differences between them reveal the uniqueness of the teleorama as a, a basis for installations. Um, so this um, is by the French artist Eva Jospin, uh, Jospin um, exhibited at the Louvre, um, and it's uh, a panorama in the historical sense in that you enter this big steel structure and you're confronted with this cardboard forest um, the way it's made is in separate sections, so these trees are layered on top of each other as, as cardboard cutouts. So if you were to look at each layer separately, it might look like one of the layers of a teleorama. Um, but they're layered so densely that they become a sort of sculptural relief. Um, the difference between this and the teleorama is that you as a viewer are not uh, immersed within the imagery. You are still separate from it uh, as if you were looking at a painting on a wall because um, you can't step into that forest. And then the other artist, one of the other artists I mentioned is um, Kivort Morad, um, seeing through Babel. Again, it's got something in common with the Teleorama in that um, it's a paper sculpture that you look through the outer layers to discover imagery on the inner layers. So you, you walk around it and each little hole um, is almost like a peephole. You look through and there's writing on the next layer inside and so on. Um, again, the difference is that you do not enter this sculpture. You look at it as a sculpture in, in three dimensions, but you cannot be within it and outside of it. Um, so, Placing installations on the teleorama moves my practice away from creating a mimetic space to a fictional one in which time and space are collapsed. It enables me to present an experience of the material and spatial qualities of contemporary ruins for viewers who have never visited the original sites. This experience is based on my observation of the site mediated through my imaginative reconstruction of it, and then again by my interpretation of this through the drawing process. My ongoing research questions whether such installations can be fully immersive or whether immersion can only be achieved through the disruption of the form of the teleorama to create an expanded space around which the viewer is able to navigate. Proscenium, which is shown here, for example, allows theoretical physical immersion, but blocks the viewer's full physical access while simultaneously offering enough visual access for different visitors to be observed. More recently, I've dispensed with the cubicle structure adopted in proscenium that defines the outer world of the installation or outer frame, responding instead to the art architectural structure of the gallery itself. For example, this image and related maquette are for the large scale installation to be displayed at the Cello Factory in London um, next month. Several installations that, that disrupt the historical form of the teleorama in different ways have been planned in maquette form. Though these proposed installations reference existing forms of installation practice, they're at the same time conceived of as large scale drawings. The form of the teleorama enables this oscillation between two and three dimensional design and drawing which is vital to representing contemporary ruin sites. These highly detailed hand-rendered layered forms will aim to preserve the ephemeral and fleeting for a uniquely labor-intensive process, creating a space that has the potential to embody multiple moments of time like ruins themselves. Once exhibited, they'll be deconstructed, never to be shown in the same configuration again, emulating the mutability of the sites presented. Through sustained experimentation with models, two-dimensional drawings and exhibiting three-dimensional reconfigurations of these, I aim to develop a new process within installation practice that can have wider applications in the field of drawing. This installation practice will propose through a combination of figuration, imagination and space, new means of evoking a sense of place. Um, thank you. <laughs>